So what we're going to do today is uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Cat Lab. Uh, I'll share uh, an example of one project we've done. Sarah will share another. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a conversation from there about the kind of work we do. And also, hopefully, uh, if there are questions or ideas that this sparks for you, we can take the conversation there as well. Sarah, is there anything you would like to add as we get started? No. All right. So um, I want to start just by reminding us um, about the hope and the potential that we think about when we think about the role of the internet in our lives. Um, you know, already over lunch, we were talking about platforms like Goodreads and other other ways that the internet has made it possible for people to share knowledge and understanding across geographies, across difference. The internet supports social connection in profound and essential ways in people's lives. And it's enabled all sorts of voice and action for change. As people find each other, as people organize, uh, they find common cause. And we've had so many ways that people have raised funds and uh, created social change online. But there are a lot of concerns that people also have about the digital technologies and the internet in our lives. We worry about harassment and hatred. We worry about uh, digital exclusion, discrimination, and censorship. And there are a lot of questions that people have about the role of algorithms in our lives. It might be uh, the Supreme Court, or excuse me, the federal case that uh, our own uh, state attorney general, Letitia James, has filed around social media algorithms and mental health that's going to be going through courts next year, or it might be people's fears and concerns about artificial intelligence. There are all sorts of questions about the role of these uh, algorithms in our everyday lives. And one of the challenges is that as much as we try to understand these things, uh, knowledge about the social impact of technologies is often locked inside of the companies that are creating things. And it's often hard to actually know what's happening. Uh, so at Cat Lab, what we do is we organize community citizen science to study the social impacts of digital power and discover effective ideas for change. If you've, if you've ever encountered the work of the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology or other citizen science movements in our physical environments, uh, then you might have the beginnings of an idea of what it is that we do, where we work with online communities to try to collect data and organize uh, analysis of our digital ecosystems to uh, understand the impacts in people's lives and, and work for change. Um, uh, that work, we hope, makes a difference in communities and also contributes to scholarly knowledge. And we've published in a range of places in computer science and the social sciences. Uh, I think for us, the ideal project has direct value to the people we work with, and you'll hear a little bit about that. Uh, we also want to contribute to science in some way. We hope that the knowledge we create together will be useful to people over time. And we also try to do work that makes a difference in policy. And there are different ways to think about policy, especially uh, given that um, a lot of the tech industry isn't regulated. So when we think about policy, sometimes it's uh, government regulation, sometimes it's like the decisions that companies make or the work that communities do to hold them accountable. And just, just briefly to give you a sense of how that works, um, we use this, this cycle where we often talk to communities with these participatory methods. We try to think about how that relates to, to science. We collect data, we do statistics, and then, then we'll often test ideas for change out in the world. And that usually involves creating some kind of research software that um, supports it. Not always, in fact, I'll share a story of a project where we had to create some software. And Sarah will share a story of a project where uh, that wasn't necessary uh, and it was still meaningful and, and powerful. So that's a little bit of the background about, about Cat Lab. And, and let's make it concrete, right? Um, I, I'm curious to hear, uh, raise your hand if you've looked at Wikipedia in the last week. So pretty much most people in the room have raised their hands. Um, and that's because it's become this really essential information source. Uh, but, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 
um, you know, when Wikipedia was just the beginnings of an idea, uh, it seemed kind of crazy and pretty impossible that you would take this idea of creating a like knowledge resource that represented the sum of human knowledge. That's how they describe what they're trying to do and create something that anyone could contribute to, anyone could edit, and it would somehow be sort of reliable and also um, useful to people. And, and in the last 20 years, it's become this essential resource that, um, you know, there are variations in quality. Uh, you can go to Wikipedia and you can read articles about every single Pokemon that ever existed and get a lot of detail on that. And there are other, other forms of knowledge that there's less information about. So for example, there's less information on Wikipedia about the mom indigenous culture of Guatemala that uh, is where my family comes from. And so there are pros and cons, there are constraints and potential in Wikipedia, but it's been this remarkable collective human resource that hundreds of thousands of people around the world have contributed to and people globally rely on uh, uh, every day. And one of the things that Wikipedians kind of had to learn is that their collective endeavors has actually made them part of each other's lives, not just the knowledge that people uh, gain from Wikipedia, but also the work, the labor that it takes hundreds of thousands of people to create and maintain this resource. When there is a war happening, uh, there are thousands of Wikipedians that work to document what's happening and try to produce reliable information and protect Wikipedia from these issues. When there are questions or debates about mental health or about deep social issues that matter, there are Wikipedians there who are trying to create this knowledge, trying to figure out what's reasonable to share and trying to manage what has become an influx of attention and attempts to manipulate the platform. And here, here is a chart of the uh, level of participation, the number of active editors on English language Wikipedia in its early years. And you can see it started out on the left with very few people, just a few people adding articles about the things they were interested in. And then it really ballooned in the middle of the first decade of the 2000s. And you had this massive growth and there's this, this study by Aaron Halfaker, Stuart Geiger, and, and others that looked at what happened when Wikipedia transitioned from something that a few, you know, people who are interested in creating knowledge were kind of toying with into this valuable resource that became a trusted, expected source of information. And one of the things that happened was that people realized it was something they could exploit. So if they put false information or propaganda or marketing in Wikipedia, maybe it would help their company or their um, effort at manipulating elections or other things. And it became very overwhelming for Wikipedians to mobilize not only the resources to keep the system going, but also mobilize the resources to keep it accurate in the face of massive incentives to game the system and manipulate Wikipedia. And so one of the things they did was to introduce moderation in the form of artificial intelligence. So that if you added something to Wikipedia and it turned out to be inaccurate, um, their AI systems would detect, try to detect the characteristics of vandalism, they called it, and remove it automatically. And that has been very successful at protecting Wikipedia but it's also been very successful at turning away people because it was trained on what it saw before. And when you tried to add new things to Wikipedia, sometimes they would be vandalism, but sometimes they would be things that Wikipedia just hadn't seen before. And they found themselves accidentally rejecting a lot of good faith contributors to the degree that um, when uh, they introduced this AI moderation system, they went from a dramatic increase in the number of contributors to Wikipedia to a decline. That so many people went, they wanted to contribute to Wikipedia, they were told by the AI system their contributions weren't good enough, that they stopped contributing. And actually Wikipedia has wrestled uh, for over a decade now with the challenge of uh, helping people feel valued and contribute meaningfully to Wikipedia uh, in the face of also 
having these AI systems that are trying to manage the influx of vandalism on the site. And so that's kind of the context of one of the studies that we talked about with a group of Wikipedians from many different languages around the world. They were worried that this AI system, all it was doing was saying, that's not good enough. There was only negative feedback that people were getting from these AI systems. And they wanted to say, are there things that we can do to encourage positive feedback for contributors uh, to Wikipedia? And they had this idea of sending uh, messages of appreciation to people who are contributing to Wikipedia. And there's you know, some scientific uh, reasons to believe that um, expressions of gratitude are meaningful and they like help maintain people's participation in public goods. And so we did some research with them on that. And the creators of Wikipedia uh, wanted to test this button that they added to the site, which still exists. Um, you may you may know that if you go to a Wikipedia page and you click on this history button, it will actually show you the record of everyone who's contributed to that article in the entire history of the article. And if you have a Wikipedia account and log in, there's a little button you can click that says thank, right? And they wanted to see if Wikipedians express thanks to other contributors, what might that mean for uh, people who are new would that help help resolve this problem of declining participation? And there are a bunch of reasons why scientists might be uncertain about this. Scientists have tended to study appreciation and thanks between individuals um, as a like, you do something for me, I thank you, and uh, then I do something for you. It's part of those like interpersonal bonds that we have. But on Wikipedia, we might never interact with the same person twice, right? One day I'm reading an article about my favorite sports team. Another day I'm reading an article about um, uh, some like medical topic. And so when someone contributes to Wikipedia, uh, maybe they're contributing to that medical topic, uh, they might be giving in the area of medicine, but receiving in the area of like sports or culture or fashion. And so this like indirect reciprocity is one characteristic of Wikipedia that made us unsure whether appreciation would have the same effects on people's participation as it does in more direct reciprocity contexts. And this is a question that came up with a group of Wikipedians uh, from Persian, Arabic, Polish, and German language Wikipedias. So they all came together at a meeting in Berlin where we talked about these issues and ended up uh, thinking about a research study that we could do to actually run an experiment where we would actually send thank you messages to lots of Wikipedians and see what the outcome would be on participation on the site. And there's a bunch of stuff that we did. We ended up having to create our own AI system to help people identify people to thank. And then we wanted to look to see what the effect would be on how long someone would contribute to Wikipedia and also whether they would go on to thank other people, right? If you thank someone, does that help contribute to a culture of gratitude where that's something that people more generally exchange or does it just stop there? And so, you know, if you're interested in the data tables, we organized hundreds of people. It, it ran from August, 2019 to February, 2020. And, and we actually included over 15,000 uh, newcomer and experienced contributors to Wikipedia in the study. Um, and uh, we had a treatment group and a control group. Uh, and if you're interested in the details of the study, we can, we can dive into them further. But overall, we found that organizing this kind of thanking actually did increase the retention of Wikipedia contributors by two percentage points. So like you don't expect that something like this is gonna solve an overall problem, but you can make small improvements. And we were able to find across, I'll show you, you know, this chart basically shows if this, if this orange thing is above the dotted line, that means it had a positive effect on people's uh, uh, duration of their contributions to Wikipedia. And uh, this is for everyone, both experienced and new, uh, newcomer Wikipedians. This is for newcomers, people who had just started with Wikipedia. And then we have charts for the results for the different languages that we did this study in. Um, so we found overall that sending these thanks did increase retention for contributors, 
And this was the really cool thing for me uh, that actually sending these thank you notes to people also increased the chance that they would go on to send a thank you note to someone else. So that not only did it help people stay in the, the uh, as contributors to Wikipedia, but it also helped foster a like cascade of gratitude across the network of participants on Wikipedia. Um, so practically, the community learned some things about how to sustain participation in their voluntary endeavor across multiple languages and cultures. And then we learned some things as scientists about the structure of thanks, of gratitude, and uh, these cascades of appreciation that we were interested in. So that's one example of a study where we had a question and need um, that was actually driven by the introduction of these AI systems into the community that led us to test an idea for change and learn some practical things uh, for the community. Now, Sarah has uh, another story that you wanna share from a different platform, the social news site, Reddit. Um, so in addition to doing um, community driven quantitative work, like the project that Nathan just described with Wikipedians, um, we're also interested in doing community engaged qualitative work. And what that looks like is maybe a little bit different, um, but it's really driven by this kind of central question of how can we do this kind of deep dive into you know, what people are experiencing without being extractive at the same time. So this is something that disciplines like anthropology, for example, have struggled with for a really long time, particularly with methods like ethnography, where researchers have historically come into people's spaces, sucked up all of the information about them, and then just kind of taken off, like not shared anything back with them. And so that's something that we wanted to avoid. Um, and so this is kind of a process that um, I've kind of come into and sort of things that I've been thinking about in my work with the community um, called Ask Historians. Um, so a little bit of background on Ask Historians, it's similar to Wikipedia in that um, it faces, you know, a lot, it's, a, it's, you know, an epistemic community where like the core idea is to get information and knowledge in this public space out to people who are curious about it. Um, it differs in that it's um, located on um, a wider platform. Um, so on Reddit uh, is a platform, if you're not familiar with Reddit, um, it is uh, sort of an, a news information sharing platform um, where users will contribute content. And then the sort of the bread and butter of the system is this upvoting system. So if you like something, you upvote it and it kind of controls the algorithm. So it'll shoot up into people's feeds and up at the top of the front page. If you don't like it, you downvote it. And that's kind of the central system around how information is sort of encountered on, on Reddit. Um, ask Historians is a little bit different. Um, it's a question and answering community where people will ask questions about history and the intent is to get, you know, high quality, in-depth, informed, trustworthy answers um, to these historical questions. Um, but that can also be really difficult when you have people that don't necessarily know a lot about history who are kind of controlling what's seen either through the question asking, um, but also through this upvoting process, right? So if you have a question and somebody answers it and it reflects some kind of common knowledge that's maybe out of date, um, somebody, a whole bunch of people feels right, so people are going to upvote it and they will, that'll sort of, that'll end up promoting it. Um, and so this has been a, this was a problem. And so Ask Historians moderators, who are sort of the leaders of the group, they're sort of in charge of developing the rules and the policies and also enforcing them within the space, have created this kind of extensive set of rules um, to ensure that the information is trustworthy. Um, so instead of just letting people kind of upvote everything and let that decide what's right and what's wrong, they remove everything. So they evaluate, you know, the information that's coming in, and if it's you know if it's wrong or if it's incomplete or if it's not comprehensive, it gets it gets removed. Um, the other you know key thing about Ask Historians is that it's intended to be inclusive. So participation on Reddit is typically synonymous. So you pick you know any old sort of username, and unlike other sort of public history spaces online, like Twitter for example, where you tend to participate with your real name. And what you say has a lot to do with your, your credentialism, right? You know, if you have a PhD or you work at a prestigious institution, you know, the idea is that people will take you seriously. 
But that's not what Ask Historians wants. You know, they want anybody who's passionate about history, you know, as long as you follow the rules, they want you to be able to, to, to participate and have this kind of inclusive um, space. Um, so this means that it operates a little bit differently um, and that they have these kind of sort of particular goals. So it was an interesting community um, for me to study. Uh, oh, I have to do, Ethan, how are you doing this? Which one were you pressing? pressing? This one here? Right button. Okay, let's do this. Oh, well, it's, <laughs> it's, I can. Uh, um, so I was really curious. Um, I had started working with Ask Historians during sort of my dissertation research um, back in 2017. Um, and that was really kind of from the outside looking and, you know, I had kind of done the, you know, traditional methods, interviews, observation, that kind of thing. Um, but that ended up kind of begging a lot of questions, like what, how, like, you know, this decision making process, like as you're deciding what information gets out there to people, um, I wanted to learn more about that, which meant going into sort of the back end and watching the conversations and the decision making processes that these moderators were having and determining, you know, what gets seen and what doesn't within this within this space so that we could learn, you know, more about, you know, moderation practices in general and moderation practices within this community um, specifically. But like, that's a pretty big ask, right? Like this is a sensitive space to go in when it's, you know, it's private. These are, you know, decisions that you know, could potentially, you know, hurt people or, you don't, you know, you don't really want it necessarily to be public. And so it was really important to me again, that this not be extractive. And so I came upon a method called collaborative ethnography, where the idea behind this is not just to kind of come in and watch and observe, but to also be a part of the kind of community yourself, you know, provide your skills, provide your labor. And then ideally in the output that will be developed like and co-created with the people in the space that you're studying with, you know, the ID, the ideal kind of output being sort of co-authorship, right? Um, as I was doing this, I ran into a few challenges. Um, the first was that I started doing this collaborative ethnography in January of 2020. A um, couple months later, COVID happened and the world shuts down. And the, the value that our online spaces had for us shifted including in Ask Historians in these moderation spaces. And so suddenly we have all of these people who are not just using the space to make moderation decisions, but they're sharing, you know, kind of intimate details about their lives and their fears and their stresses and sort of, you know, what's happening as, you know, they're petrified about what's going on. It's like in uncertainty. And so I really wasn't quite sure, you know, what I should be doing in this space at that time. And so, um, I really at that point kind of transitioned instead of like being a researcher studying a moderator, I kind of became a moderator studying a researcher or studying a moderator who's also a researcher, if that makes if that makes sense. Um, so sharing and kind of giving back myself in in that kind in that kind of way, which really shifted, I think, where the research took, like where it went after that. Um, another one is this idea of like collaboration and labor. Like when you want people to collaborate with you, you're asking them for work. You're asking them for time, effort, energy, all of that stuff. And so this is a group of volunteers who are doing this in their spare time. And I actually did try to start a project with another one of the moderators that arose through the discussions that we had. We would meet and try to do this co-writing and it just never really got off the, 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 like the ground in part because he was so busy and just did not have time to kind of prioritize this. Um, but I didn't want that to just kind of be the end of it. And so in writing up the results, which I'll share briefly on the next slide, um, I developed sort of a low effort way for people to collaborate and contribute to the writing um, that like wouldn't end up taking, you know, that wouldn't have the same kind of requirements that, you know, sort of co-authorship would have. So basically what I did, I shared a draft of the paper that I was writing, allowed the moderators to vote on it. So whether or not they were comfortable with me actually publishing it. And then once they were, I invited them to comment on it. And so add reflections that were then included in the paper as footnotes. And so those were not edited by me at all. I didn't curate them, whatever, whoever wanted to include them could. Um, and whoever didn't want to didn't, there was no pressure to do it either. And so though that was that information also became data, which I was then able to use 
um, in the to draw kind of conclusions from from the paper itself. Um, and then so just um, a little bit about that. Um, as I was doing this um, work, you know, you're doing the moderation, you really kind of feel from the inside how much moderation actually sucks. Um, when it's like, it's almost like it's, you know, what Nathan was talking about at the very beginning of the of the talk, where um, we have things like harassment and abuse. So if you under moderate, you're getting all this disinformation and all this crap. But if you over moderate, you end up censoring people who typically end up being the people who are um, most censored, most marginalized already in society. So it's this really, you know, kind of tight, tight rope to walk. And so what I ended up doing is drawing from um, intersectional feminism to explore how power can manifest in, in moderation and how we might think about and use intersectionality to sort of frame our moderation practices um, in order to make more inclusive, safer online spaces for everyone. So in the paper, I told a few different stories, um, one about disagreement, one about a moment of collaboration, and one about a moment of conflict to talk about you know, how we have to, and demonstrate, you know, how we must account for power when making these kinds of moderation decisions, how moderation can reinforce it and also resist oppress oppression. Um, and also highlighting the kinds of support that moderators need. They're working within these algorithmic systems. They need tools. Um, they need help in order to do it. They also need support from the platforms themselves because when you're confronting power, you're often subject to things like online abuse and harassment. Um, and we also need more support. There needs to be some empathy building between people who are affected by moderation and the people who are doing the moderation themselves. Um, and I just have one last um, slide and point I wanna make. Um, I said that I was, I'd kind of transitioned from a, um, you know, a researcher researching moderator to a moderator doing research, but I'm still, I'm still a researcher, right? And that means that I still have a particular position of power, especially because I am not only just a researcher, I'm also a researcher at a prestigious Ivy League institution. And that means that I have power and people listen to me. And if I'm going to do this, I'm going to, I'm going to be an advocate for these, um, for this group. Um, and so this summer when Reddit, the platform announced that it was making changes to access to its API, which you know we knew right away was gonna be massively destructive to both the research community and the moderator community um, in collaboration with the Coalition for uh, Technology Independent Research. Um, we, um, we initiated a uh, fact-finding um, and letter-writing campaign um, I also spoke extensively to the media in order to make sure that moderators' perspectives were represented in the public discourse. And I also represented moderators' interests a couple weeks ago at a live Q&A session with Reddit's um, CEO. Um, so it's not just about the work that we do at Cat Lab. It's not just about doing the research. It's also about using the power that we have to be advocates for the people that we work with. Thanks, Sarah. I just want to um, wrap with a few a few reflections on Cat Lab. Now that you've heard a, about a couple of our things, you know, as as I've noted, as and as Sarah has described, part of what we do is this research and evidence. Part of it is this organizing with communities. Uh, part of it is like working on methods and software, whether it's uh, like computational methods for the statistical work I described, or Sarah's deep work on like how you do qualitative research. Um, and to give you a sense of um, of that, you know, some of that has has taken different forms. Um, uh, one of those areas we've been doing more work on has had to do with uh, ethics and privacy, particularly thinking about um, uh, as we do research with communities, uh, collect data, and as the data of communities becomes more attractive to some of these companies who want to build AI systems on the back of that. How do we think about the ethics and privacy questions uh, from the perspective of those of those communities? And the, the range of topics we, we've taken on have included online harassment, political conflict and understanding online, misinformation, content moderation, um, uh, censorship online, digital inclusion topics. We've done some work on phone addiction concerns. We have a project right now on um, transparency around hiring algorithms. Uh, used by employers, 
um, and some of this work on data ethics and privacy. So I hope that gives you a sense of the kinds of things that um, we've taken on uh, at Cat Lab and the kinds of topics we're interested in. And um, it maybe won't surprise you that we're especially interested also in hearing from all of you, both people online and in this room. And so although we were asked to take 50 minutes for our talk, we actually wanted to end a little bit earlier so we could hear uh, either your questions about these presentations or uh, the issues and uh, concerns you have about AI and technology and society to think about how those things could be translated into to research questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now we're going to transition into questions. If you all have a question out in the audience, um, I'm happy to take it. Also, are there any questions online? Not yet. Yeah, what, what, uh, working here? No, okay. Um, uh, truth is uh, such a critical aspect of what both of you have been talking about, although more so the uh, um, <laughs> the Reddit type work. And uh, what I was uh, concerned about was uh, how do you uh, validate a moderator? How do you deal with possible biases in moderation? And what's the impact of that? That is a huge question and one that um, we are wrestling. I, I'm still moderating. Ask I did. I just didn't leave, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I, 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 when I talk about ask historians, I talk about we now, um, and that's actually a huge struggle that we are dealing with right now, as you can imagine, with the conflict that is happening between um, Israel and Palestine, and as people are turning to a space online that they view as trustworthy to get information about something that's highly contentious. Um, and the, the thing, we don't, we don't have an answer. Like part of it is drawing from sources and source work and, and trusted historians that are doing this work. Um, but even if you look at the conflict, like right now, there is no consensus. And so part of that has been um, allowing those, you know, that kind of non-consensus to, to sort of surface a little bit, like having people engage in sort of discussions and, and back and forth without, you know, dipping into, um, cause people get really heated. So that kind of thing gets removed right now. Um, but it's, it's hard because like, there's a chance that like, the information that we are either allowing or removing is telling a particular story or a particular perspective, and that is influencing how people are going forward. Um, and there's, we don't have a good way of dealing with it. It's mostly just kind of trying to recognize and reflect on our own biases, similarly to like how you might engage in reflexivity activities during, um, uh, you know, qualitative research. Um, trying to be transparent about some of the decisions that you're making. But I would say that that's something that like moderators in general, I think need more support for and something that they're probably disincentivized from doing, particularly the transparency type of work, because in this case, like you're going to get somebody, somebody is going to be upset with you. Like either you're anti-Semitic or you're like promoting genocide and like either way, no matter what you kind of do, you're you're subjecting yourself to all kinds of harassment and, and abuse. And so that really disincentivizes um, people from being as transparent as I think would be helpful in this. Um, so that's something where I think, you know, more research needs to be done because it's, yeah, very complicated. Yeah, maybe I'd add, add a little bit to that from a kind of research perspective. Like this is one of the fundamental challenges, right? Um, uh, there's work by Benjamin Mako Hill, who co-leads something called the Community Data, uh, uh, what is it, the Community Data Science Collaborative? Yeah. Um, and uh, they're working on this like theory of 
um, uh, the relationship between the like size and popularity of an online space and the value of manipulating it. Basically, the larger and more influential something becomes, the more valuable it becomes to influence. And there's a point in uh, the kind of trajectory of online communities. It could be an online community for discussing your favorite uh, movies or books or a community for discussing history, right? Um, uh, that the thing you started with your friends kind of grows and more people are excited about it. And they it might in fact be excited about it because of the intimacy that you've created together. But then you hit this tipping point where it becomes powerful and valuable to manipulate. And I think um, one of the challenges for people who do these kinds of things is to recognize when they're hitting that point and see that they might need to change some things. Like Wikipedia started out as some people in their homes writing about the things they were passionate about and putting them online. And now we have like Wikipedia correspondents in war zones, like trying to fact check information so that when people try to cite Wikipedia, it's reliable, right? And that's a just completely different kind of endeavor. I think for Wikipedia, uh, you know, their, their biggest, uh, one of their biggest strengths is that they rely on published literature. So it needs to be in a newspaper or in a book. Um, and you can often point to that and say, well, you know, that at least addresses a lot of uh, uncertainty. The problems are that there are a lot of parts of the world and lots of cultures whose histories haven't been as well represented in books. You know, I mentioned the mom indigenous community. Um, we don't have a lot of books and the books that we had were actually burned during the, you know, conquest by, by the conquistadores. And so, um, that's one of the ongoing struggles for uh, Wikipedia as a community and how to reckon with those things. The last thing I'll say is there's a there's a psychology researcher here at Cornell, Gordon Pennycook, who's done some really interesting work to study, on average, do we expect uh, groups of fact checkers to be reliable? And even though we might have doubts that um, uh, individuals might have biases or motivations for certain things, they found some promising evidence for ways that we can combine people's capabilities and kind of structure fact-checking tasks to uh, actually get pretty reliable outcomes. And that's something I'm I'm hopeful for, for the future. I realize we've probably way over answered this question. You've asked the question that we're really passionate about and struggle with and is, is, is a hard one. So, so thanks. And, and, you know, I know we were talking earlier about like, just the challenge of that in book reviews. So like, it's not just Wikipedia or historian context. It's like, should I buy this thing on Amazon? It's a, it's a broader challenge. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm a researcher in AI in health, and um, I actually conducted a lot of community engaged research with cancer patients. A lot of problems we encounter is that there's no guideline or matrix to evaluate our community-engaged research. So I'm eager to learn from your experience, like how to set up the matrix or guidelines or framework for conducting this kind of community research. Thank you. Do you have qualitative reflections? I don't have any. You go first. Okay. Yeah. So so you know this is this is a topic that I know people in this. Bronfenbrenner Center community have lots of experience and thoughts on. So uh, others in this room might, might have suggestions as well. I think there are a few models to think about. So I know in the like medical and public health wor world, there is actually a profession of people who do this kind of community engagement. And like for hospitals and so forth, there are like rubrics and um, structures for uh, like uh, community panel input and feedback. And so that might be, that's actually something we've been really interested to learn from uh, as we move our work forward, because the medical world does have a little bit of a more structured and better funded tradition than um, the world we work in. But there are a few things that we do. Um, 
So at Cat Lab, we, um, you know, we talk with communities about what we and they want out of the experience um, going forward. Um, we're not necessarily implementing things that get taken up by necessarily the same kind of powerful institutions as like a medical device or, or technology. So it's a little bit different, but we do have a set of like surveys and evaluations that we um, distribute to uh, the leaders who collaborate with us, like the, the community leaders from different parts of the world who I shared there, uh, that we report internally and we report to our funders and we use to adapt what we do. We also have structured our projects, at least the, the technical ones, um, so that our software is designed that if community members object and decide they don't want the study to happen after all, they actually hold the switch, right? If they want to halt the project, they can. And we actually had that happen once. We were working with a, a German language Wikipedia, and we thought we'd done sufficient engagement, and we didn't realize that we were only talking to half of the community. And the people we were talking to were really excited about the project, but they hadn't talked to the other half either. And so we spent months, we launched this project, and then the other people were like, what, 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 what is this thing that you're doing? And um, uh, they, they used that switch and actually turned off our project. And we we're like, we started getting errors from the software. And we we're like, oh no, is something wrong? And we learned that actually that feature we'd introduced so that we don't control if a project stops um, was used successfully. And we've done a, a fair amount of research on this question of like, who holds power in, in research projects and who should hold power and how researchers can design the outreach and also the design of the computational systems so that participants as a group ha have some agency over whether a project goes on and also so individuals can make decisions even after the fact about whether they want their data to be included in the study. We give people the chance to remove their data from our studies if that's something that they prefer to do, especially when we're doing research on topics like online harassment and online violence, which can be, be very sensitive. And so, so that's an area of computer science that we're working on, like these like models of consent and um, oversight by communities, but happy to like continue the conversation further. There's a, a paper by Jonathan Zhang and me that just came out uh, in the Journal of Responsible Computing this fall that looks at, the title is Data Refusal from Below. And it looks at these questions of, of the kind of rights and uh, interests of participants in research or anyone who's a subject of data collection um, and how to think about those people's agency from the perspective of design. Richard. Hey, Nathan. It's good to see you, my friend. Hi, uh, Sarah. Um, excellent talk. I, I learned a lot. Um, my question comes as one of the junior faculty in the room. I really am a big fan of your Venn diagram where you show how your research has value to the community, also informs science, and has uh, relevancy for policy. Um, I am wondering, and if both have a response, it'll be great um, based on your respective roles. But um, how do you balance that as a junior faculty, as, as an early career scientist at an Ivy League uh, academic institution? Because uh, I struggle with with that. <laughs> so I'm sure I can learn from, from your perspective. So do you want to open with your story of the last year? <laughs> um. Are you thinking like some of the 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 campaign, the White yeah, House? Yeah, yeah, I know. I was like, which which one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So that's something we've been thinking a lot about, and like actually kind of struggling a little bit with like how to balance it. Um. Because the work that we're doing is so relevant to a lot of like the big P policies that are kind of up for grabs right now. 
uh, or not up for grabs, but like are sort of in in development. But it's also been a really it's also been really challenging, kind of trying to figure out where to place our expertise and like where to comment and how to spend our time. Um, so like a couple of sort of I think maybe like lower effort things that I've done has been to talk to relevant agencies at the White House, particularly about um, data access and data ethics. Um, in addition to the work that I do with moderators, I've also done quite a bit of research on um, how users feel about their data being accessed and where we have policy coming in from the European Union, the Digital Services Act, that actually mandates researcher access to data in certain circumstances. Um, you know, kind of navigating how to actually do that because there have been lots and lots of cases where researchers have misused users' data, Cambridge Analytica being a big famous example of one. Um, I also spent most of my summer doing this, not in like the government policy kind of way, but in trying to um, influence Reddit's decision-making with regards to their, their API decision-making, like weeks, just all I was doing was talking to the press, um, uh, which it was a new thing for me, and was but I got used to it, I guess, pretty quickly. Um, and then, you know, sort of kind of continuing on, having these conversations with Reddit, um, doing these kinds of campaigns. And it's been, I mean, it's been successful in terms of like, at least, you know, getting media attention and things like that and being able to share those stories. I... I'm not sure how successful it's been on Reddit's end, um, but we're still trying. Um, that's something like, you know, following the um, Q&A session that I had with Steve Huffman, you know, following up with that, writing an email, hopefully he probably won't respond, but, you know, we'll figure out what to do from there. Um, yeah, um, we, could, we could have a whole week talking about this. Uh, a few a few reflections. So So one, I think, when deciding projects, we try to anticipate, like, what do we think the scholarly contribution will be? What, what you know, we actually, when we, when we brainstorm research projects with communities, we rate them along those three axes, right? And we try to have a project do two, at least, right? Um, so that's one part of it. I think another part is learning over time your place in the wider like policy ecosystem. One of the hard lessons for us has been to realize that the communities we work with don't typically get paid attention to in policy conversations. That may be other people's experiences here, but usually when we enter a room and we bring community members, um, we're bringing perspectives that no one in the policy space that talks or thinks about, right? If if you go to a um, uh, an event in Washington D.C. or if you go to Davos in January, and you're in a room about AI policy or tech policy, like those rooms are not going to include um, the, volu the the volunteers of of which there are hundreds of thousands of people who are doing unpaid labor to keep our digital worlds running. Right? They're just going to completely exclude and not even think of those people. Um, no one's going to think to invite someone from Wikipedia to a conversation about AI, even though Wikipedia is used to train all of the AI systems. They're going to invite the CEOs of the companies, right? Or they're going to invite the like very prominent like thought leaders in the space. And so part of our role is to show up with people who wouldn't ordinarily get listened to and, um, support them to share their voices and experiences, either through some of the surveying that you did, Sarah, or like, Sarah, when you were asked to, to do a Q&A with the CEO of Reddit, Sarah did a survey and a like mass like effort to find out what people's questions were so that she wasn't just showing up as Sarah Gilbert, she was showing up as Sarah Gilbert and like the many like volunteers of Reddit who the company's actions were affecting. You know, the, the challenge of that is that then because you're trying to put new narratives on the table, you don't necessarily fit into the slot that people are used to thinking. You know, it's not like, oh, we need, you know, the policy folks often think we need a person of this shape 
to be in this conversation, we'll just grab this person and you get the invite. And so we're learning how to um, position what we do. And also we're learning how to like elbow into the room with communities uh, through campaigns where that's necessary. And, and we just submitted something together with a bunch of Cat Lab folks to the federal government's um, open call for input on AI policy. And basically our, our fundamental story was there are a lot of people who are affected by AI who are already contributing labor to this, whose mental health and well-being are infected by this, affected as they do moderation and other things. They're left out of the conversation. And White House, you absolutely need to make this labor and these people's work part of the conversation. And we'll see how successful we are at that. But let's have a let's have a drink and talk about the like navigating the like tenure track part of it as well. So we have a question online and then we'll go to Tony and then we'll wrap up. So our question is and relates to the previous question. Any suggestions for confronting power, a framework or etiquette or philosophy that all of you have that you'd like to share? For, for what with power? Uh, that you'd like to share with Oh, us. a framework for confronting power. Yeah. Um, a few things. Um, I think I think it is very context dependent on the nature of the work you're doing. Um, so, um, you know, I know, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the edited collection, the scholar as human, uh, which is actually a beautiful reflection of like some of these ways of thinking about it. Um, and so that's one book to, to look at beyond that. I'd say one thing I find really helpful, um, and you can look more up about this is, is a practice called power mapping where you say, you write down who are the different actors in the space you're doing work in? What is the power that they have? How likely are they to actually listen to you and pay attention to you? And what do they pay attention to? Like who is influential to them? And then position yourself in that space. So, and I find that by thinking explicitly about the actors and who has influence and what kind of influence is important, that makes it easier for me as a scholar and sometimes organizer to choose where to put my energy. Um, and I think the other piece of advice I would say is like, uh, ask who you want to do this with, right? Uh, like confronting power or adding knowledge or uh, you know creating collective capacity, those are all things you don't do alone. And so more than anything, finding the people you want to do this work with is one of the most important things. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add about that, Sarah. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, like I have never done anything nearly that sort of like formal or like as formal as power mapping, um, but it is something that like, I think part of it for me is that it's ongoing, um, particularly like the qualitative research that I do. You know, when you are sort of engaged and embedded in a community for so long, you know, your power kinds of kind of shifts as you're in it um, and sort of kind of constantly reflecting on like what power I have relative to the people that I'm engaging with um, and how that is going to be reflected in sort of what I do and the decisions that I make um, and how how I present the work that I do and the conclusions that I draw. So, you know, my position of power, like relative to users who I can censor by removing things, my position of power relative to users who know who I am because I moderate with my real name, um, which is, you know, female coded, and I get like gendered, you know, abuse and harassment for doing it. So, like, my power relative to them. Um, you know, my power as a researcher and like how I can leverage that um, when necessary. Um, so yeah, I guess just just to emphasize that it's sort of an ongoing process, I think for maybe not like an, in, an, an ongoing informal process for me. Thank you. We're gonna wrap there for the sake of time. 
Um, but thank you both so much for this talk. You can give them another round of applause.